This is Fans on the Run, a podcast made by, for, and about Beatles fans. And now, here's your host, Ethan Alexander. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Ethan Alexanian. Uh, That is how you say my name. I will emphasize this every week until the hosts of Talk More Talk pronounce it right. Um, The main difference between this podcast and any other Beatles podcast is because I have no idea what I'm doing. So... Do with that what you will. Anyways, we I think we're going to have a good show today. Our guest today is the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine, author of Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Mm-hmm. And if you've been to any Beatle Fest in the last 40 years, you'd recognize him. Al Sussman. Al, welcome to the show. Hi, Ethan. Nice to, nice to be here. Is it? Nice to be anywhere, actually, these days. Yeah. Well... I, I miss when we were actually allowed to go places. Yeah, that, that's for sure. <laughs> it's, I, I don't like living through, uh, I don't like living through a historical event. Yeah, I was, in fact, I was just talking to a friend who's uh, around, uh, around my age and we've seen, <laughs> we've seen a lot of stuff and, uh, you know, over a, a long period of time and uh, we've never quite seen anything like this. It's, it's, I, I don't even know, I, I have no words. Yeah, pretty much. It's, um, it's kind of indescribable it's like something out of the bizarro the bizarro world in the midst of all of this madness how are you holding up oh fine fine you know i'm a you know a i'm a creature of habit b i'm retired and uh uh so it's not all that different it's just that i'm you know i'm not able to uh you know go places other than, uh, you know, a couple of times a week going to uh, the supermarket. (laughs) Yeah, it's my crippling record-buying addiction. I'm starting to go through withdrawal. I'll bet. Yeah. Luckily, I still have a uh, dealer, so to speak. Ah, sure. Who, just as long as, like, you you keep doing the sanitizing and the masks, like, I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm still able to buy some records out of Toronto. So ah, yeah. good. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, the uh, the famous um, the famous Jer- uh, Jerry's Records uh, in the uh, the Squirrel Hill section of uh, of Pittsburgh is is you know they're not operating you know with customers coming in, but they're doing mail order and other things. So they're still alive, but uh, but it's it's tough. I've been to Jerry's before. You have, yeah. Uh, oh. I went to Pittsburgh to see Ringo a couple years ago. Uh, I was probably there. Uh, at uh, what's what's the place? I'm looking at the poster on my wall. Uh, probably uh, Heinz Hall. Heinz Hall in 2018. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, we were at the same show. Yeah. Exactly. All I really remember from Jerry's, though is that some homeless man came up to my mom in the car and started banging on the window. Yeah, not surprising. Yeah. Unfortunately. Didn't have, didn't have many Beatle records, though, from my memory. No, I do. I, I, I seem to recall that they didn't really have, uh, you know, have a whole lot, but uh, um, they certainly make up for it with other things. Oh, yeah. Oh, they had, like, a really good Motown section. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm a sucker for, you know, 60s Motown and Phil Spector and all that. Yes. So oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no question about it. That's uh, a lot of what I grew up listening to. Yeah. So here's my favorite part of the show, Al. Is there anything you would like to plug? Uh, okay, the the new issue of Beetle Fan Magazine is uh, just just out within the last. Uh, uh, I guess the regular subscribers have just gotten it within the last week, and in there I've got the first part of a uh, uh, a two part 
a kind of assessment of uh, Paul McCartney's uh, 50-year post-Beatles career. Mm -hmm. And how much do these Beatle fan subscriptions run you? You know what? I don't have the uh, I don't have the information on that uh, right at hand. Uh, there is a uh, I actually you can, can make find up out. a number. Uh, I don't that I don't want to do. <laughs> but actually, it's e it's easy to, uh, to get the information. There is a, a website uh, www.beetlefan.com. Also, um, there's a Beetle fan page on uh on facebook and i believe we have a twitter account as well but uh uh certainly with either either facebook or the website you can get the uh, the subscription information because unfortunately um all of our you know the all of our old retail accounts are virtually all gone uh, Tower Records was like our uh, our our main uh, our biggest retail account, and of course, they've been gone now for several years. Yeah, I think so. The I think they... so the best way to get the magazine is to subscribe. I I think I'm going to have to subscribe in the near future. Oh, you absolutely should. Yeah, it's. I feel like I have to as a mm -hmm. Beatles fan. It's in the name of the magazine, Beetle Fan. I'm a Beetle fan. Yeah, exactly. I like magazines. Mm -hmm. What is there not to like? Yeah, absolutely. And and one of your previous guests, uh, Kid O'Toole, is our uh, uh, kind of our internet editor. Mm. And um, she does a column in every issue called Hard Day's Net. Uh, plus she does, you know, some features as well on occasion. Yeah. So, folks, next time you uh, go to your local Tower Records, make sure to pick up a copy of Beetle Fan. If you're able to find a Tower Records, uh, you're, <laughs> you've got a scoop. <laughs> or, or just get the subscription. Just yes. get the subscription. That's that's yeah. also there is we do have also a um, uh, a blog site called Something New. Oh, do so tell. you might want to check that out. I'll put the links to all of that stuff in the appropriate descriptions wherever okay. I, I... I need to get in the habit of putting people's uh, links and stuff in the uploads. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm still very new to this. Oh, I, you know, I've, I've been very... I, I haven't uh, heard the show with your, with your uncle yet, mm -hmm. but the other three shows with... Uh, uh, with Susan Ryan and Kit and uh, and Ken Womack, all of whom are friends, um, uh, I really enjoyed a lot. I got word that Mark Lewison has heard my podcast and thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoys it. So yeah, I made this comment last episode. Mark, if you're listening, and I know you are, <laughs> come on my show. I I I. I've made it a point that at some point I will have Mark Lewison on. Oh yeah. It's it's um, it's the end goal here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And he's uh yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately he's getting pulled in all different directions while he's trying to do the uh you know, the second volume. Second so. volume of the alleged three part book series. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it'll, but it'll be, it'll, it'll be worth the wait. Oh, I, I know it will. Mm -hmm. I'm still working my way through uh, the first one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm stupid, so it takes me a while. <laughs> now, nah, it just, it, you know, it just takes a while to, because uh, there's an awful lot of information in there. So it's, uh, and I don't even uh, have the big expanded edition. I just have the normal one. Yeah, and that's so big enough. I have no excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giving um, myself a public shaming. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessary. You Not son necessary. of a bitch, Ethan. Why haven't you finished it? You've had the book for three years. Uh, I've found that actually audiobooks. Um, That's you know, the thing. I have the are... audiobook too. 
Oh, okay. Well, that well now then you don't have any any, any excuses. I know. Because <laughs> like the I audio book will be will be quicker. <laughs> I can't even pull like the well I'm illiterate card. Yeah, I host right. a podcast, so I'm not deaf. <laughs> Anyways, yes. Enough self deprecation. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about you, Al. Okay. Al. When did you first discover the Beatles? It was Tuesday night, January 6th, uh, no, January 7th, 1964. Um, um, I'm at home, um, allegedly doing my homework. My, I was in eighth grade. Uh, allegedly, 15, don't fact check us on this. Right, allegedly doing my, uh, doing my homework, or at least I was supposed to be doing my homework. Yeah. And uh, but uh, with my concentration was more on um, WABC in New York, which at that time was becoming the biggest top 40 station in America. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to Scott Muni, who later became um, one of the pioneers of FM rock radio in uh, in New York. Uh, and um, it was Tuesday night was always new survey night. Mm-hmm. And so I uh, always made it a point to uh, to you know to you know to to listen to the you know at least the first hour or so of the show to hear the top seven songs mm-hmm. of the week while I'm allegedly doing my homework. Yeah. And um, uh, so uh, and before they would do the survey, he had like an uh, like an oldies block. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned something about a Beatles fan club. And I thought, what the hell is that? You know, and, uh, but, you know. So at this point, you didn't know who the Beatles were. No, I had no idea. Uh, And, uh, you know, it was, uh, yeah, but I, but, you know, disc jockeys had fan clubs with weird names. So I just didn't really think anything. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most prominent DJs of all time is like has the word wolfman in the title absolutely so you have to take everything with a grain of salt very much so absolutely. and plus this is also the decade of the pet rock if i'm not mistaken so no, that strange- was the, that, oh. no that was the 70s oh okay yeah i was gonna say well stranger things have happened oh well yeah well there were plenty of strange things in the 60s oh. um so eight o'clock comes and he starts doing the survey and uh you know, especially if you get getting toward number one and Louie Louie by the Kingsmen, which had been number one. Great song. The, the, the last couple of weeks was had had dropped. And I'm trying to think what what uh, what on earth could be the number one song? It wasn't that it wasn't there. I've said it again by Bobby Vinton. It wasn't Surfing Bird by the Trash Men. OK, now I love that song. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a classic. <laughs> And uh, so gets to the number one song, and on comes the, the 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 jingle, and on comes this song that I had never heard before. And and my immediate reaction was negative, because it was uh, it was I want to hold your hand, mm-hmm. and it was that and she loves you really were so were so different and. So, from anything that was being played on the radio in the, in the, at that at that time at the beginning of 1964 yeah that it it sounded like something from another planet and my reaction was uh, was negative mm-hmm. and um, and then you know I get to get the this school doesn't but- sound like surf and bird no, it, it doesn't sound like Surf and Bird. It doesn't sound like Louie Louie. It doesn't sound like um, California Sun by uh, the Rivieras. You know, it's uh, it's totally different. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then the next couple of days, I get to school, and and all these all these girls are going crazy over this group that they probably hadn't heard of a week before. And so I'm building up a pretty good you know, a pretty good um, uh, level of resistance. 
and uh, you know, which which you know really la- In fact, and it was it 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 was getting stronger as January went on because at five o'clock in the afternoon on again on WABC they would play and, and in those days they didn't play two or three songs in a row at all and they played the th- you know the three Beatles records that were available at that point which was I want to hold your hand she loves you and please please me mm-hmm. every afternoon at five o'clock weirdly on three different record labels very true yeah because um, because you know as soon as I want to hold your hand took off VJ paired actually please please me and from me to you the two singles that they had released mm-hmm. um, on on a single and Swan re-released she loves you yeah and and both of them immediately took off so you know I'm building up this uh, the, this level of resistance and by the time we get to February and when they came to America and um, uh, appeared on the Ed Sullivan show, I was pretty much pretty much had the attitude of, OK, Beatles, show me how good you are. Show me that you're worth all of this, uh, all of this attention. And, did and they? Uh, well, the first show didn't do it. Really? Sullivan, yeah. It, the first Sullivan show uh, just for whatever reason, maybe it was be because it was in a you know in the kind of sterile confines of a of a TV studio. Al, I'm did, starting to suspect you don't like the Beatles. At that moment in time, I didn't, and um, so the first show didn't do it. The next week, the the second show, as you probably know, yeah. uh, was the one from in Miami, Miami Beach. And um, and that that was the one that did it because um, for one thing the the sound mix was uh, accentuated Paul McCartney's bass and Ringo's drums mm-hmm. and I mean let's face it there's the the best rhythm section in all of rock and roll so that got to me plus. Um, they're playing, um, unlike being in a TV studio, they're playing on a stage in a, in a ballroom Mm -hmm. and a small stage. So they're, so they're fairly close together. Yeah. And they're at that point, I didn't, I didn't know this until years later, of course, but at that point they were only a few months separated from, from still playing ballrooms in England. So they're so they're really more in their element mm-hmm. at this point, uh, and plus also when uh, when they did this boy and John Paul and George, you know, were together in front of that microphone, I thought that was like very cool. It still is. Yeah, it absolutely is, and uh, so that. Um, I was definitely getting getting one over. Let's put it that way. I wasn't completely there. And then the following week, uh, the show that actually had been taped on February 9th, uh, where they did Please Please Me and they did Twisted Shout, that did it. But that, that was that back couldn't... to the sterile TV studio. It wasn't yeah, even live. Right, I know. And, and it wasn't even live, exactly. So, uh, but that was like... The, the knockout punch <laughs> that so they actually so rather than give in to all of the hype that was going on um, they actually won me over mm-hmm. and I think maybe that's why I became the fan that I became mm-hmm. so you were a Beatles fan in terms of the US pretty much from day one Pretty much, yeah. Except for you know, except for uh, January, except for January and uh, a little bit well, of February, mu- and, and a fair a fair amount of February. Mm-hmm. Certainly by the uh, the last uh, the last Sunday in in February, nineteen sixty four, I was a fan. Mm-hmm. So you got to experience the Beatles as they happened. Abs- that you know, that's something that I that I feel those of us who are from the the first generation i think we were privileged in that 
in that respect, that we got to experience this all in real time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, not just the, you know, not just the excitement of the tours and all, but also the development of their music, Mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, from album to album. And which was, you know, very eye opening and and also, um, uh, I think I think it made me uh, appreciate um, appreciate other, um, you know, other types of. I, I shouldn't really say other types of music because I already appreciated other types of music. But I I did appreciate the fact that they're that they didn't that they weren't just a you know like a boy band doing yeah. doing the same doing the same stuff for seven years that they that their music developed and it developed in giant giant strides mm-hmm. that if you listen to each album. There's, um, you know, there's a there's a very great progression from album to album. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even imagine what it would have been like um, to have those things like hearing the first little bit of I feel fine for the first time. Yeah. Or, you know, experiencing rubber soul. Yes. Absolutely. And the funny thing is, with albums like Rubber Soul and Revolver, I actually, I would play them for friends. And they weren't, they weren't really all that impressed. You know, they, they had been fans and then it was like, I don't know, this is kind of different. And so they really weren't uh, weren't all that uh, weren't all that excited about those albums, and in fact, by the, say the beginning of '67, I had friends who were telling me that the Rascals were a better group than the Beatles. Now, hold on. <laughs> I I like Good Lovin' just as much as the next fella. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would go that far. Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, but, have you ever seen that clip of, I think it was American Bandstand, uh, mm-hmm. where they played Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, and they were asking right. the audience what they think. They look like old men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because none of them had mustaches, and then suddenly they all had mustaches. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and John had the, you know, it did started wearing the you know the granny glasses and and all and um and yeah it was uh it took some it it took some getting used to yeah you know but uh uh but yeah they uh friends were um convinced that that the rascals were a better group and but then and i and by this time penny lane and strawberry fields were out and and i said uh, okay you yeah. You'll see, and sure enough, you know, because the word was out that this that the next album was going to be, you know, something very special. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, when when my friends heard Sergeant Pepper, that was the end of any of this. Rascals are better than the than the Beatles stuff. See, there there isn't a a fest for Rascals fans. No, there isn't. But there's also not one for the Stones. There isn't one for the Who. Fair there isn't point. one for Bob Dylan. Yeah. You know. There isn't one for Dave D. Dozy Beaky Mick and Tish. No, there certainly isn't. And that that's disappointing. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> you have to live and let live. I'll talk to Mark Lapidus about that. Yeah, we'll have to do an offshoot for, for Dave D. Dozy Beaky and Mick and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Don't even try to say it. You'll have a stroke. Yes. It's taken me months of practice. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) So what was your initial reaction to um, Sgt. Pepper? That's one of those one of those memories that, you know, I can I can absolutely remember as if it was yesterday going to um, 
a store in Hackensack, New Jersey called the Relic Rack. Okay. And getting uh, and get it on that on the Saturday morning. So it was actually the day after the record was released and uh, getting getting my copy of it and getting home as quickly as I could and uh, and putting it on uh, on this crappy little Emerson one of the one of these fold up um, record players. You know, I mean, they didn't have speak. It wasn't stereo. It was mono. Yeah. But it was like, a, it was a portable, you know, a portable record player. Did you at least buy the mono record? That was all they had was okay. the mono. And in fact, I still have it. Really? I still have them for, I guess, for really just for sentimental reasons. I still have that mono copy. Can I have um, it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it is in such hideous condition you wouldn't want it anyway <laughs> yeah. it's oh yeah because it was played on again this crappy little portable uh uh portable record player and you didn't keep any of your other beatles records um i don't think so no no because the 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 mono ones i actually gave them um gave them to a girl that i was interested in <laughs> How'd that work out? Uh, unrequited. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Sergeant Pepper, I can't. Desolé. Yeah. C'est la uh, Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but yeah, that first listen was was absolutely amazing because it was, you know, it uh, it was unlike anything that I had ever heard. Mm -hmm. It was, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain because, because yeah, Sergeant Pepper is kind of of its time. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not the, it's not the greatest album of all time. As some people say, it's not the Beatles best album. No, but um, I but still it's, don't understand why Rolling Stone has it as the number one album of all time. Well, I think it's because of the fact that it's the most important album. It is because it because it really changed the focus of the of the music industry from being one where the single was the pivot point to. And I mean, it didn't happen overnight. Yeah, but it started. The process and the fact also that there was, you know, that there was FM, FM rock radio just beginning as well. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, that certainly helped in in changing the focus from the single to the album. So the music industry kind of switched gears from 45 to 33. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Especially, again, it wasn't overnight, but certainly by the... You know, by the beginning of the seventies, uh, that was that was it. You know, it was really it was really the album that was really the more the more important unit. Where were you when you found out the Beatles had broken up? Uh, that's a, that's another one. Um, I I was working in those days for a, a record distributor in um in rochelle park new jersey and um and i was on the way on the way to work and um <laughs> pretty much anybody that knew me back then uh if they if you know if you were to mention my name uh they would say oh yeah that's right that was that that was that fat kid that always carried a radio around with him because I did. Don't beat yourself and, up. <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, it's it's fact. Because I did. I, uh, you know, and and in fact, to this day, I can't, you know, you know, because I, I don't drive. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so to this day, I do, uh, you know, <laughs> with my iPhone, uh, you know, I'll listen to radio or podcasts or whatever. So it's it hasn't really changed that much, but but. That day, Friday, uh, April tenth, 
1970, um, put the radio on, I'm on the way, on the way to work, and I hear, um, I had uh, WMCA, which was the other big top 40 station in New York on, and um, the, uh, the morning disc jockey, comes out of a uh, comes out of I think he I think they played played a Beatles record and he comes out of the record and he says it's official Paul McCartney has left the Beatles and now this wasn't a complete shock because actually there had been a couple of days earlier there had been some rumblings because of the fact that um uh, media copies of the of Paul's album, his solo album, uh, were beginning to kind of make the rounds, and and in the album, in the media copies, were this self interview. So there were rumblings that all was not well in uh, in Beatleland. And this is so, the same uh, interview where he said that the Lennon McCartney partnership was basically dead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it, it's funny because people because there was no, there was no proclamation saying I'm leaving the Beatles or the Beatles are finished. You know, he just said in the in the self interview that he had no plans to work further with with the Beatles or to write with John or, you know, various other things. Um, and especially those of us who um, had been fans for, you know, a number of years already, we, you know, we kind of knew that they, they had always said that if one member of the group left, that would be it. Now, we didn't know that, you know, that, you know, that George had walked out during the get back sessions that Ringo had walked out during the white album sessions that the previous September, John had said, I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, so Paul was the first to make it public. And a lot of, a lot of us, uh, did kind of assume that that's, you know, that's it. That's the end of the group. But there were others, uh, who, uh, who thought, thought well you know maybe maybe this is just temporary and uh and they'll you know they'll get back get back together and then on new year's eve paul files basically hey sues you know sues them for divorce yeah and that really was that was the you know the the sort of the final nail in the coffin in, to an extent yeah so how did you turn from being just a Beatle fan uh, to kind of being a professional Beatle fan? Well, um, during that same period, uh, this is in the, in the late 60s, I was doing a, um, a teen center column for a, a little town newspaper in Maywood, New Jersey called Our Town. And... Um, the, the column ostensibly was about what was going on in, you know, local events, dances, you know, what the local bands were doing. But I was, you know, kind of uh, subtly, you know, sneaking in stuff about the Beatles and about other, other rock groups. And I did that for about two and a half years. And then in the mid seventies, I did a uh, a collector's Q and A column for a kind of like a Rolling Stone esque um, record store freebie called Sounds Fine. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if you're aware of it. There was a there was a magazine that uh, that catered to fans of punk and new wave called trouser press i've heard Is of that, the name okay uh and um they were around for a few years and i mean they it was a great magazine uh and then in 1979 they actually bought out sounds fine and 
they they wanted me to to do a uh, you know to continue the column I was doing, but to really make it you know kind of gear it more toward the the punk and new wave audience. Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't prepared to do that, so I I you know I did one one column under the new uh, you know the new administration if you want to call it that the new regime and the new regime thank you and it didn't really work out that well so i just decided so we just kind of mutually decided that i was going to move on plus that was at the same time that um at the beetle fest in new york in february of 1979 um, I, um, I, well, for one thing, that was like the first one that I was, uh, kind of actively involved with, uh, Mark Lapidus put me on a, uh, a panel with Wally Petrasek and Nicholas Schaffner, the author I have, of the Beatles. Uh, Wally coming on next week. Great. Excellent. Excellent. He'll, he'll be a great guest. And, uh, Nicholas Schaffner, who unfortunately, you won't be able to have on as a guest because he passed on uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but you're, I know you, I think you, I think you mentioned it on perhaps on the show with Kit, uh, the Beatles forever, which mm -hmm. is one of the seminal Beatles books. So I was really, you know, I was pretty intimidated <laughs> being on that panel, but also, um, um, Bill King, who was the publisher of, of Beetle Fan, he was there. Um, they had a table uh, in the flea market uh, with his uh, with his wife Leslie, and uh, I, you know, met them and signed up as a, as a subscriber. And uh, I guess a couple of couple of issues later, uh, Bill put out the word that he was looking for a, a New York correspondent. So I figured, what the hell? <laughs> so I, I volunteered, volunteered for that. And so I became the, uh, the New York correspondent and, uh, which was basically in those days, cause there's, you know, there was no internet, there was no social media or anything like that. So, Basically, my job as the New York correspondent was to take um, articles from newspapers, you know, pieces of news or, or features or whatever, and um, cut them out of the newspapers, put them in a, vanilla, uh, in a manila envelope, and send them down to Decatur, Georgia, where uh, Beetle Fan is, is published out of. And um, So you were like a professional scrapbooker. Uh, yeah, you could, you could say that, you know, uh, basically, um, and, uh, but it was like, it was really more news gathering than, yeah. than scrapbooking. And, um, uh, and then at the end of the, uh, the first year, uh, the, yeah, uh, the end of the, the magazine's first year, actually, I, um, suggested that you know that i might like to uh, maybe do you know do an article or two and so my first two pieces were in the the first issue of the of the of beetle fans second year so i just actually just recently celebrated my 40th anniversary with beetle fan <laughs> it was a quick 40 years you don't look a day over 30. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you've been with Beetle Fan for 40 years now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's... That's... A, that's like three times my life. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm 17. Yeah. And in fact, uh, in fact, Wally... Um, uh, also came on board at about that uh, around that same time during the first year, and uh, in fact, he uh, it was Wally who actually kind of coined the um, uh, sort of our our slogan, which is the the Beatles publication of record. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and of course, of course, at that by that point, Wally already had a uh, you know a pretty good uh, reputation because uh, at that point, I guess um, he and his co-author um, Harry Castleman uh, they had done actually two of the three um, the three huge discographies. <laughs> Uh, that they did there at the uh, at, in the the mid and late seventies. One of them was all together now. I know that all together now was the first one, and then the second one was called the Beatles again, and the third one, which came out actually in the early eighties, I think uh, nineteen eighty three or eighty four, was called the end of the Beatles. <laughs> You know, little, <laughs> little, little did we know that that was not the end of the Beatles, which, uh, which in fact is um, kind of the hook of a piece that I'm working on right now. Um, that'll be in Beatle Fan a little bit later on this year, and uh, uh, it's probably going to have to be like the McCartney assessment. Um, it's probably going to have to be split into two or three parts. Um, it's a, it's a piece on what I'm calling the afterlife of the Beatles mm -hmm. because they that just wouldn't die. Yeah, absolutely. When you consider that they, uh, you know, that after the, um, uh, the rooftop concert, they never appeared in concert, you know, again. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in fact, never, we're never in a recording studio together after August of 1969. And despite that, they have had an incredible amount of success. In More the, than most bands in, while they're still together. That, that's very, very true. Yeah. Very true. You know, they, uh, uh, they've had just an, an incredible amount of success when you consider... <clears throat> that they had in the uh, in the 70s alone, they had four top five albums, three of which were two record compilations. That would be the Blue and the Red. And the Blue and the Red and... Rock and um, Roll Music? And, and, rock, um, and Rock and Roll Music, yeah. I was thinking it was either that or Love Songs. Uh, no, love songs didn't do quite that well, mm. but uh, and the the said the one single one is the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl, yeah, which would have been a number one album except for the fact that it was on the charts at the same time as Rumors, yeah, or Fleetwood Mac. For a second, you had me confused there, and I'm like, Rumors. What rumors that the Beatles right. are getting back together? And then I realized, no, Fleetwood Mac, you fucking idiot. <laughs> Use your context clues, Ethan. Right, exactly. <laughs> Fans on the Run, the podcast with the host that hates himself. Yeah. <laughs> and takes it out on his guests. Right. <laughs> so... What do the Beatles mean to you now, as opposed to back then? As opposed to back then. Um, or it could just, if they still mean the same thing to you, like, you can say that too. Well, the, the, uh, the thing that I, that I keep going back to is that they were, um, is is that they actually expanded my, my musical palette quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in um, the spring of 1964, uh, a, a, a sort of promotion man, semi-newsman uh, named Ed Rudy, Mm -hmm. um, released a documentary album oh. of um, right. You've probably yes. I've you've seen probably that. seen it it's called the Ameri the American Tour, which was about the uh, the Beatles' first visit mm -hmm. uh, in February of '64. And um, on the Saturday, the second their second day in America, 
He did, uh, this is when, when George Harrison was bedridden with, uh, you know, a little t- touch of the flu. Mm-hmm. And um, while the other three were out, were in Central Park doing a photo op, um, Ed Rudy was able to get George on the phone and um, they had about a 20, 25 minute conversation which was, you know, I mean, for that time, a long form interview like that was, was really something. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions he asked, uh, George was, you know, what, uh, what kind of music did you, you know, did you grow up listening to? And, um, or, or I, no, actually, I think it was more the, you know, what, what kind of music influenced the group? And he mentioned he mentioned the early Elvis records, and he mentioned Buddy Holly, and Carl Perkins, and um, so that. And I kind of picked up on that because I'm I'm a little bit too young to have really had much of a uh, of much of a background with '50s rock mm-hmm. because, like, when I mean, I do have very vague memories of seeing Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show in, uh, in September of uh, 1956, but I had just turned seven mm-hmm. at that point. And, you know, it didn't really, didn't really register all that much with me. No. So, so I, I mean, I knew a couple of songs here and there, but, you know, I really didn't have much, you know, much in the way of context with a musical context with Elvis. So that summer, I, I went over to a store and picked up the original Elvis's Gold Records album, mm-hmm. which was, you know, basically all of his um, hits from Heartbreak Hotel through Jailhouse Rock. Mm-hmm. So all the stuff from 56 and 57, which are, and those are the records that, you know, that, that turned on the future Beatles. Mm-hmm. And then I, and I also got one of the, there were, there were all these, there were so many different Buddy Holly greatest hits type albums. Yeah. So I got this one called Buddy Holly's greatest hits. And because, and, and I could tell immediately that they had been a, or that how much they had been influenced mm-hmm. uh, by, by Buddy's music. And, And so that, you know, that kind of began kind of the expansion of my, of my musical palette to an extent. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think, and and especially the fact that their, that their music developed the way it is and the influence that they had on, on, you know, the whole generation of American groups that emerged in 65 and 66 um, so, you know, they really were a, you know, like a major catalyst for a particular, what I would consider a golden era of American rock music. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably, you know, what, you know, what immediately uh, comes to mind when I think of like what do the Beatles mean mm-hmm. mean to me? Plus the fact that their, you know, that their own music was of course so you know so incredible. I mean, there's um, I have debates about this with uh, with people. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they're the 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 Beatles catalog, the especially you know the core. EMI catalog. Yes. Um, and the and the solo years are two completely different um, um, c- two completely different catalogs, mm-hmm. if you want to put it that way, uh, because the you know there are you know there there are highs and lows mm-hmm. in in the solo work. It's its own entity. It's its own entity, but it's not as um, uh, you know. It's the 
It's not as consistent. It's not as consistent. Exactly. The consistency of the, of the quality of, of what they accomplished as a group just does not, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's plenty of good music Mm -hmm. that they, you know, that they put out as solo artists, but, um, but rarely did it approach the level of what they, what they accomplished as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, the, what's the, 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 uh, the saying is the, uh, you know, the, the, the sum of the parts doesn't equal the whole. Mm -hmm. The only uh, pieces of the solo catalog that I think even approach the quality of anything the Beatles did, uh, all things must pass. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm hesitating even saying uh, the Imagine album, but I'll I'll say that. Well, a lot of their work from the early, you know, the early and mid 70s, for one thing, they still had the the aura of the Beatles Mm -hmm. um, with them. Uh, But also, and and of course, there were a lot of, especially on All Things Must Pass, a lot of the songs that are on there are songs that George wrote while he was still a Beatle. Yeah. And which, in fact, uh, they they worked on to at least some extent during the uh, the during the sessions for the, you know, the Get Back album and and, and Abbey Road as well. Mm hmm. You know, so there's, you know, and uh, it's, um, again, though, there were highs and lows. And I mean, they, I mean, they, you can tell just immediately, just on Paul's first three albums, on McCartney, Ram, and the first Wings album, Wildlife, um, there's, there's stuff on there as far as I'm concerned, there was never, there was never filler on Beatles albums. You know, later, you know, later on, there were little curiosities like, why don't we do it in the road or wild honey pie? Dig it. But yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, but there was never any, you know, there, uh, because they, they took the philosophy of wanting to put out a high quality product. Mm -hmm. with all their albums so it wasn't like the old philosophy of you know would just put on put on a couple of hit singles and then 10 pieces of junk yeah but on the on those first three mccartney albums Mm -hmm. you've got you know yes you know yes you've got maybe i'm amazed and you've got too many people and you've got backseat of my car monkberry moon delight and Monkberry Moon Delight and and uh, and uh, Tomorrow on on Wildlife and Dear Friend, but you've also got nonsense like Mama Miss America, Bip Bop, and and Bip Bop, and you know, long haired lady, it's, it's three legs stuff like that, which just is not worthy of at least to me is not worthy of the McCartney name. Funny enough, Three Legs is actually a perfect way to describe Paul McCartney's second marriage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, unfortunately, Heather was not really a very good muse. Nah. Because Paul has done, has done great work since, uh, you know, basically starting with Flaming Pie. And the one clinker in all of that, in all of the albums that he's put out from Flaming Pie right up through Egypt Station, the one clinker is Driving Rain. Or which as is the, uh, YouTube personality Mean Mr. Mayo, who is going to be a future guest, likes yes. to refer to it as Thriving Pain. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's it's not a very good album, and so and that was the one where Heather was kind of like his his musical muse on that album, and uh, certainly was not the the muse that uh, that you know Jane Asher or Linda or Nancy had been. Yeah, because I don't think Heather gave Paul anything like maybe I'm amazed or even my Valentine. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. She wasn't uh, wasn't the kind of, uh, you know, musical inspiration yeah. that produced those songs. I just wanted to touch on a point that you said earlier. Mm-hmm. That the Beatles turned you on to so many types of music. Mm-hmm. And, and the same is true for me. Because I, I can even kind of map it. Like, without the Beatles, I wouldn't have heard the Stones mm-hmm. uh, or the Who. Without the Who, I wouldn't have heard the Kinks. Without the Kinks, I wouldn't have heard the Small Faces. Mm-hmm. Without the Small Faces, I wouldn't have heard the the Move. And right. del- delved into this whole realm of 60s psych of the British Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it's all, res- or it's the Beatles are responsible for it. Yeah, for absolutely. Inadvertently turning me on to all of it. Right, exactly. They were the, they were the catalyst for all of that. Now, without the Beatles, most of that music we never would have heard here. <laughs> all right. What does it mean? Or, oh, wait, I already asked that question. Um, what's your oh, favorite... Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, but what does it mean to yeah. uh, to be a Beatles yeah. uh, Beatles fan to me, right? Again, fans on the run. The only podcast where the host doesn't have their shit together. What's nah, your, you're, what you're, is your favorite memory days, of being still. a Beatles fan? Boy, that's tough because, of, you know, actually I've already mentioned a few of them. <laughs> uh, you know, the first listen to Sgt. Pepper, the... Um, 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 you know the first the first listen to I want to hold your hand uh, things like that um, uh, let's see um, you can plead the fifth if you can't think of any more <laughs> well I mean there are, there are, there are a number of them uh, like I never now I never went you know guys back then didn't didn't really if like if you if you've seen obviously you've seen film of yeah. of the Beatles in concert and if you look you don't see a lot of males there no and the ones you do see are plugging their ears they're either plugging their ears or they're you know like really geeky or they're there to pick up girls yeah it's like that guy from the Robert Zemeckis movie I want to hold your hand yes yes exactly Right, the greaser character. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, Lives in the hotel. Right. So, uh, so I, you know, most guys didn't really go to... Oh, no, no, the Eddie Deason character. Yes, that's the one, right. Um, right, Klaus. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ringo Klaus. <laughs> and, um uh, but like most guys, you know, didn't, you know, they didn't go to the airports or they didn't go to the hotels and stand out front with all those girls or they, uh, you know, or they, and they didn't go to the concerts. Yeah. But you did see a lot of them burning their albums though. Oh, well, yeah. You know, well in 66 after that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true, but the, that's uh, a particular brand of uh, of um, people who were really just looking to, you know, get on television or whatever. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> not unlike today. Yeah, I was um, going to say, the breed is alive and well. Yeah, it and certainly thriving. is. And thriving. Yeah, it certainly is, unfortunately. But, um, um, Especially with yeah, the reality so really... TV precedent. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. But the... Um, I sit um, from my glass house as I throw stones. Right. As a Canadian. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. But the... Um, uh, now, even though, though, I didn't go to the concerts or anything like that, uh, because of how hugely popular they were, uh, the top 40 stations covered a lot of you know they cover their arrivals at the airport or they covered or wabc for instance had uh they had a mobile studio uh in the in the hotels where they stayed Mm -hmm. 
And um, was WABC and, uh, Murray the K's station? No, that was WINS. Ah. And in fact, um, uh, they weren't around very long as in in the in the Beatle era because in uh, the beginning of early in 1965, they went um, they went all news. Oh, yeah. So they were they were out of the uh, the top forty uh, sweepstakes uh, pretty early on, um, and although Murray again later on, much like Scott Muni, went into you know FM FM rock uh, very early on. He was you know in a sense a pioneer there, but um, but as far as you know memories, you know hearing. Um, hearing Scott Muni and Cousin Brucey and people like that, you know, broadcasting from the hotels. And uh, when they played, when they, the first concert at Shea Stadium, the fellow that was, that did the Sunday night show on, on, on WMCA broadcast from the, the broadcast booth at Shea Stadium, where the um, you know the, the the booth where the the Mets games were broadcast from, mm-hmm. and um, at just just as the Beatles were being introduced by Ed Sullivan, uh, they were coming out of a commercial break, and you know you know obviously you've seen the film, so you hear the you know the the incredible noise mm-hmm. that was coming from, you know, 56,000, uh, mostly girls. And, um, and, uh, Ed bear, the fellow who was the DJ, he's yelling, trying to kind of make himself heard above this din. So, <laughs> so that, stuff like that, those are the kind of, you know, good memories and also the like the premieres of the uh, of the you know the 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 promo clips, uh, especially the the clips of uh, Hey Jude and Revolution on the Smothers Brothers show, yeah. things like that. Those are the you know kind of the the really good memories. All right, I'm gonna hit you with the quick fire questions. Okay, what is your favorite Beatles song? Uh, I cannot give you one. I can give you, I can give you five. You can, you can do five. Okay. I'm being a uh, little unfair by making you pick one. Right. <laughs> Cause nobody can give yeah. you one. And even like the top five changes from day to day. Uh, no, they're right. They're not in any order. Yeah. Um, and there are other things that could, that could go in the top five, but, um, at least these are the five. Um, all you need is love. No airman. Hey Jude, here, there, and everywhere, and here comes the sun. Solid choices. And if if um, and I wish uh, you know, it's squeeze into a top five, a sixth song. I would probably something by Ringo. I would probably pick Good Night. Really, I don't mm-hmm. think I've ever heard that mentioned as anyone's particular favorite yeah i know it's uh, i i don't understand why because it's it, it's it's a gorgeous gorgeous song I mean, it is it's, you know uh you know the, the you know uh the the gentle side of john lennon although to me it sounds something more like uh, something you'd find on the Moody Blues Days of Future Past album. A little bit because it's so heavily orchestrated. Yeah. Which is interesting because people were so outraged about Phil Spector putting, you know, an orchestra and voice, you know, choral uh, backing on The Long and Winding Road. Mm-hmm. But there's an orchestra and choral backing on Good Night and... I've never really heard anybody complain about that. Oh, I think that's because the Beatles intended it to be there. Well, yes, that's yeah. true. That's true. All right. What is your least favorite Beatles song? And if you say M- Mr. Moonlight. It's not Mr. Moonlight. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. You know, it's... I 
no mm-hmm. one has said Mr. Moonlight for the last few episodes, but mm-hmm. I think it's the shell shock from my first two guests, both right. saying Mr. Moonlight. Yeah. That, that's kind of my knee jerk reaction. It's like, fuck, don't let it be Mr. Moonlight. Because I for don't want to s- have to keep defending it. Yeah. For some reason, it's become fashionable to to knock Mr. Moonlight. And uh, I mean, it's it's OK. It's, you know, it's just, a, you know, it's, a, uh, you know, it's an R&B cover. Yeah. If you want to you hear know. my thoughts, listen to any of the previous episodes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, but what is um, yours? Um, probably um, if I had to pick if I had to pick one. Probably something like um, something like why don't we do it in the road? <laughs> you know, little curiosities like that because there really are. Um, I can't think of any any major songs of theirs that I would say this is probably my. Le-. I mean, if I had you know, if you if you had to say something like. You know, no, no, you can't do one of those short little things. You have to actually do a, you know, a full song that would be your least favorite. Probably something like I Dig a Pony. Yeah. Not a big fan of that one either. Yeah. All right. What is your favorite Beatles album? Keep in mind, you can either choose from the British catalog or the U.S. catalog. It would, uh, well, again, I can give you a top three. Okay. Um, it would be um, the White Album, Abbey Road, and either version of Rubber Soul. Okay. And of course, now with you know with Spotify, you can you can actually re- you know make your own you know super duper Rubber Soul by you know combining the you know the, the American track listing and then the four songs from the British one yeah. and and then tack on we can work it out in day tripper. Yeah. Uh you didn't say revolver, so I will have to deduct some points. Okay. That is scientifically proven to be the best Beatles album. Don't fact check that. Don't Google that. Um right. yeah. <laughs> what is your least favorite Beatles album? Okay, I'm going to... And you can um, pick British, American, or even compilation. That's where I'm going to cheat, because I can't, I cannot say that any of the, the, the core catalog is a least favorite. Okay. So actually, the one I'm going to pick is Real Music. The movie compilation. Right, which, you know, I just thought was a, just not a very imaginative... Yeah. Um, Cap- compilation Capital was really scraping the bottom of the barrel at that they point. Were. Absolutely, they were because yeah. it's yeah. it's like where where did they have to go from there? It's like ah, mm-hmm. rock and roll music, uh, love songs, uh, uh, the Beatles ballads, uh, 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 movies. Let's yeah, they had some of those. Let's do that. Yeah, and and that uh, and then. Uh, the ne- the next one after real music was you would have figured would be a you know a sure shot to be a, a hit album uh, called Twenty Greatest Hits yeah and it peaked at number fifty on at least in America it uh, it peaked at number fifty which was the the worst performance of I think any. Capital, Capital, Apple, Beatles album. Oh, and Apple you know? had nothing to do with that at that point. Uh, well, it was, they were, you know, yeah. I mean, it was basically, although there was, there was a version of that same album that was released in England that actually did a little better. But uh, the the irony is that, you know, that album peaked at, at, at you know, number 50 here, and then 18 years later, a very similar compilation comes out, and it is, depending on which, which chart you look at, it is, it is, well, if for one thing, it was the biggest selling album 
of the first decade of this of the 21st century okay. and it is again depending on which list it's it's among the top 10 biggest selling albums of the 21st century despite the fact that the newest note on that on that album I'm speaking of course of one yes um, that the newest note on that album was recorded 50 years ago yeah so I mean that's that is absolutely amazing it's um, nobody expected that to happen all right it, I think we're at that part of the show where it's it's very tragic uh, we have to wrap things up. Oh, I know. I we're both in tears. Absolutely. You know, it's heart wrenching. Yeah. Anyways, if you this want, is... if you want to hear more from Al, uh, go get your subscription to Beetle Fan Magazine, or go down to your local Tower Records if you're still living in two thousand and five. Something like that. Yeah, and go get his book, Changing Times. 101 days that shaped a generation that uh you may have uh you um for the book you probably may have to go for the uh the kindle version Mm -hmm. because the the print version is a little tough to get right now all right so for those of you at home go buy a kindle and then buy this book or if you have a kindle app yeah. You can, uh, you know, on your, you know, your iPad or whatever, or your phone, whatever. Yeah. You can, um, you can get it there. Yeah. Bottom line is just get his fucking book. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't be an idiot. Right. So, thank you so much, Al, for coming on. Thank you. Absolutely. It's this, been this it's been a great. treat. It, yeah, it's been a been a treat for me. It's uh, it was a a fun uh, as as James Taylor would say. It was it, it's been a fun hang. All right. So, and for those of you at home, uh, well, I'm gonna break the fourth wall here. I'm recording a big batch of these episodes in a two week span. I don't know when this episode will be uploaded. Uh, maybe by then the coronavirus will be over. Maybe. The planet will be uh, completely taken over by the lizard people. I don't know. Uh, But yeah, thanks for listening and ta-ta for now. Fans on the Run is produced by Ethan Alexander. Additional voiceovers by Richard Fulton. This has been a Showtown production.